You're watching Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. Today, we've been covering the cabotage issue back to back from 9 o'clock. Uh, and just before we started our show, consider this was talking to Rais Hussein of MDAC as well as my ex's uh, Chiu. Well, we have uh, in the studio Alexander Wong, the managing editor of Suya Chin Chow, whose article actually sparked off this debate and started somewhat of a wildfire. So, Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, let's, let's, let's take things slow. Right, because uh, when we look at the whole issue, this issue is not something that has happened over the past two or three days. This issue has been going on for years now. Um, and if we can re revert back to why the capitalist policy was introduced back in the 1980s, actually, yep. um, it was because they want to grow the nascent uh, shipping industry of Malaysia. But somehow or other, April 2019, the Pakatan Harapan government sort of like decided this is not the way to go. We need to have you know, a liberalized market. We need to ensure that we are playing uh, the uh, globalized uh, kind of uh, player here and we want to get the cabotage policy to be uh, suspended. And that was done by the Pakatan Arapan government, specifically Anthony Lok, the previous transport minister. And then, of course, uh, November 2020 came about. Uh, current uh, transport minister, Wee Kaseong, says, you know what, that's it. We're going to reverse the reversal. Uh, and the capitalist policy is back in action. And because of that, we've seen how my ex has been coming out and saying things like uh, Malaysia losing out. Um, and just before we start our show, he said the same thing again and how this impacts us as a consumer. Um, and, um, you know, vibes uh, with uh, Emmanuel uh, Samarati, Samatirasa was talking about how um, th there are sources that have been reported to say uh, it's because of the um, suspension of the cabotage policy that they have reverted. So generally speaking, those are the kind of events that have unfolded. My question to you is, you've been reporting this for years now, so Yachin Chia has been covering this for years. Why was it like blown out, blown out of the water um, over the past two or three days? Uh, there's something that uh, I'm still figuring out right now because we've been covering this since um, last year when the current transport minister actually revoked the exemption for the cabotage policy. So if we take the step back, if we go to April in 2019, uh, almost two years ago, so what happened was that um, the transport minister, um, Anthony Locke, has, in, has announced that there is an exemption for the cabotage specifically for submarine, for vessels coming in to repair submarine cables uh, in Malaysia. For repairs? For repairs, repairs only. So there are other cabotage for, like, for goods, for passengers, they still remain. So and even cable laying is not part of this, right? He only mentioned specifically for repairing. Okay. So that was the issue. And uh, according to uh, Anthony Locke, this was requested by our local players like Telecom Malaysia, Time.com, and it was also supported by Gomin Singh. Uh, they actually announced this together in Parliament in, uh, in, in April 2019. All right, so Gobin Singh was the communications minister uh, when Pakatan Harapan was the government. That's right. Okay, and then because of the local players demanding this and the government responding to this, um, were there any reports on how the uh, Malaysian Shipping Association, MASA, was reacting towards uh, the suspension of the cabotage policy back in April 2019? Did they make any noise, basically? Uh, I can't recall uh, any reports on that. Uh, but what I do know is that the reason why they brought the exemption in the first place is because the tech, in tech giants have been complaining that it's taking too long to repair because of the current uh, process which requires a DSL. So basically, it's like a, like a, um, a, a license to allow them to come into Malaysian waters. That can actually delay the repair process up to 27 days. It's just too long. And according to my IX, as they reported, that has uh, you know, reduced Malaysia's attractiveness to invite more submarine cable investments into the country. So we are far behind our peers in other, uh, other players in Southeast Asia. So um, uh, Dr. Wee was talking about uh, the local company. There's only one right now, and that vessel is DP1. Um, and that vessel is carrying out the maintenance and repairs, and foreign players can still come in to sort this out and he says that it only takes what five days on average three days mostly um, and he was talking about at one on one case up to seven days but generally speaking he's saying that there shouldn't be any delays the way we uh, see it being said by Anthony Loke up to 27 days um, do you do you agree with this kind of uh, uh, view I agree with what he, what he said because back then the 27 days was based on the old DSL process. And as mentioned by the current uh, Transport Minister, Dr. Wee Kao he said that there is a new EDSL process which actually reduces the time required to approve 
these permits. So he said in Parliament, this cuts down the time from 30 to like uh, 10 to 5 days. And as he mentioned, that uh, Masa is only given 48 hours to object for any applications. So the time has been reduced. So to his credit, yes, it's been reduced, but yet it's still a concern to the tech giants because it's still added ne unnecessary time to the repair times. So um, our guest yesterday, Nabila Hussein, um, uh, the tech fellow at uh, Suri, was arguing that these cables uh, essentially belong to the tech companies and therefore they want to have full control over how they manage these kind of undersea cables, uh, including maintenance and repairs. Um, and it's unlikely for them to try to allow for other players to sort it out amongst themselves when they can have the capability and ability to fix it themselves. Because of this, there's a grievance that is kind of uh, reaching a boiling point to a, to a situation where the tech giants are now approaching um, the Minister of Science, Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation. They've reached out to... Uh, the Ministry of Communications, um, as well as the Finance Minister. Um, and they have even been reported, at least you guys have reported, that it has been, uh, there's a memo that has been uh, sent to the Prime Minister. Um, is it because they can't find um, a pathway to sort out this kind of resolution with the Ministry of Transport? Is that why they're reaching out to all these other people? That looks like it because I think um, what's missing here is there's no dialogue between, there's lacking of dialogue at least from what I see between the tech giants and the transport ministry because the, the tech giants have been voicing out their, their concerns that they're missing out in terms of the DB2 capabilities because they require DB2 vessels which has a high capability to maintain a specific uh, position in the water and that's critical for in terms of safety and insurance purposes. However, the transport minister has said that you don't need DB2, DP1 is more than enough. So there's these two clash of uh, views on what is required. But like, like you said, right, the tech giants have their own concerns. And of course, they want to have full control because tech giants are bound to their own SLAs. If something happens to the submarine cables, they need to be assured that they can fix it as quickly as possible, as effective as possible, based on the specs they require. So this argument of um, DP1 is enough, but tech giants say DP2 is required, right? What was the basis of uh, Wee Kassiong saying that DP1 is enough? He was quoting sufficient. And of course, we're talking about just one vessel, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah, so based on what he said to into the Edge in an interview, he said that he, he talked to the shipping companies uh, and some industry players in the shipping industry. They said that DP1 is more than enough. The only difference is just software difference. He said it doesn't make a difference. And he also said that the justification... Overlapping, right? Overlapping, yeah. yeah. And he also said that the reason why DP1 is sufficient because most of the waters in Malaysia is shallow. So that's one argument. However, the tech giants still insist on having DP2 because that's what they need to give the assurance that they can fix the, uh, the submarine cables in a proper manner. What about the two other arguments that you brought forth, which is um, avoiding South China Sea because American companies are wary of the Chinese surveillance? What do you think of that? I think, yes, there's somewhat of a concern, but I think it shouldn't have a major impact in terms of submarine cable investments in Malaysia. I think that's still ongoing because if you can see right now, there are still plans to come to Singapore and Indonesia. They're quite close by. So I don't see that as like a major stumbling block for them to increase the submarine cable investments in Malaysia. Mm. And then the second argument, which is, of course, there's no data center here. And then the um, Tanjung Kling uh, data center in Singapore, and that's why they go there. What do you think of that? I think the argument that there's no data center infrastructure in Malaysia, I don't think that's true because Malaysia has a thriving data center industry. In fact, uh, in the past two years, we've seen new data centers being uh, developed, being introduced in Johor and in Cyberjaya as well. And the, the recent one is a KVDC in Cyberjaya by TM. So the, the data center industry has been thriving in Malaysia. So it's not true that we don't have the data center infrastructure. You were uh, writing um, in, in, a, in an article, if I'm not mistaken, two days ago, asking the, finance, uh, asking the transport minister three questions. And of course, the first question is, have we addressed the tech giant's uh, concerns? My question is, why must we address the tech giant's concerns? What, what's, what's at stake here, basically? The, because of this uh, situation, uh, we are seen as not favorable to the tech giants. Uh, in fact, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the Ash also reported that the, some of the tech giants have told Dr. Wee that because of this cabotage policy, they will review their investments here. So that's the, the issue. And of course, uh, my IX, they also issued a statement that the cabotage policy also creates an uh, environment that we are not favorable to investors. 
So that's the, the core issue. I'm sorry. I, sorry. I, st I still want to uh, focus on that one because, okay, so what kind of investments are these tech giants putting in? Is it fast internet? Is it greater connectivity? Um, are we a gateway to other markets, say for instance towards India um, and perhaps even Africa, who knows? W what's, what's at stake when it comes to addressing the tech giants' um, investments here? One thing is that if they have more submarine cable landings here, uh, we have more, a more robust um, digital uh, infrastructure. So we have more capacity to carry more traffic, which is actually growing in Malaysia. And that will also link to other my digital initiatives, like more data centers can be built because we have more submarine cable landings in Malaysia. Mm. And for users, that means that we have better internet services, um, a more robust internet experience because we have a better infrastructure and with more data centers, um, that's definitely going to improve in terms of uh, enterprises because you know most of the companies are moving to the cloud and that will actually affect everything. Uh, you were publishing a, a report uh, by MDEC um, and MDEC's uh, white paper which is talking about the situational analysis of the undersea cable uh, in this region. Um, one notable feature in that um, I guess disclosure that you guys made was that Singapore is the de facto place uh, for cable laying uh, in this part of the world. But more concerning is that uh, Thailand is also looking at using their Songkla pathway to, well, in a way, cut short uh, the whole 1,200 kilometers worth of uh, uh, tr uh, uh, pathway, yeah. right? The undersea uh, 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 highway, so to speak, across the Straits of Malacca. And, and we are cut off north and south um, in terms of the cable laying process. Is, is this a serious concern for us uh, to actually address? Is the cabotage policy hurting us uh, in a way where we are losing out to both uh, Thailand and Singapore? Definitely, because um, like I said, um, because of this cabotage policy, right, this is going to be seen as a stumbling block for them to consider Malaysia as a landing site. And Malaysia has a lot of things to offer for these investors. Number one, we have the right people, we have a growing digital talents, uh, our geographical location is actually quite strategic. So I don't see a reason why they shouldn't land in Malaysia compared to our neighbours. Okay, and which is begging that question of why um, this government, the Perikatan government, um, through uh, the Ministry of Transportation, under the penship of uh, Dr. Wika Siong, um, reverted the decision that was done in the previous government. What was their main, their primary reason uh, that the capital policy has to be reinstated? From what he said in Parliament, uh, the greatest focus was to protect our local shipping industry. And he also gave a couple of reasons. Like number one is to build our local shipping capabilities, talents, and also to protect the security and sovereignty of our water. So those are the key issues. So it's mainly on the shipping industry. Mm. But as you mentioned, right, uh, Malaysia only has DP1. It's only one ship at a time of revocation. And the thing is, if, if let's say we grow our local economy, uh, sorry, let me do that no, yeah, local, local shipping industry. Yeah. 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 The thing is, if we grow our local shipping industry, if let's say the transport ministry set a target to, let's say, the Malaysian uh, Shipping Association, say, saying that, okay, you know what, there's a demand for DP2 ships. I think that's something that we should grow. So that, you know, because based on the targets of my digital, uh, we're going to have more submarine cables. If, let's say, there is an uh, opportunity for Malaysia to grow, that should be done. But that can be done in parallel with having a cabotage exemption. Um, do you think there's a way out uh, uh, from this particular I guess, entanglement. How do you think the government is going to resolve this very quickly? And we all know uh, that the tech giants are indeed talking to other parties outside of the Ministry of Transport. We haven't seen anything yet, no announcement just yet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've been covering this for years now, actually. Um, and, and reading your article with delight uh, because you give a lot of um, details uh, in terms of who is at, uh, uh, who are the main players, um, um, what is at stake, um, and of course, the history behind the whole process. How do you think this will pan out? Um, my true hope is that hopefully the Transport Minister will have a proper discussion with the Communication Ministry and perhaps with the Prime Minister to find like a middle ground on how we can solve this issue. Because the tech giants want to invest and also uh, the, the Communication Ministry, uh, especially uh, Saifun Abdullah, because it is his KPI to ensure that Malaysia has the most submarine cable landings by 2025. That's his own, uh, That's, my, my digital blueprint. Yes, that is his responsibility. His KPI to deliver the most submarine cable landings in, in Southeast Asia by 2025. But he hasn't spoken much about it. So that is his KPI. 
So for him to achieve that, he needs to address these issues that's raised by the tech giants. So I hope that all these parties will sit down together and find a middle path. Do you think this will be done, in your opinion? If Malaysia is serious about achieving the My Digital uh, Initiatives, its goals, it has to be settled sooner or later. All right. Uh, we'll go for a short break before we conclude our conversation with Alexander Wong of Suez Chinchao. We'll be right back after these messages. Thanks for staying on with us. We have with us Alexander Wong of Suez Chinchao. Let's talk a little bit more about the overarching decision that the government wants to undertake that was announced about two months ago, uh, which is the My Digital Initiative. Uh, it's a 10-year roadmap talking about the kind of things that is needed to grow the digital economy of Malaysia. Um, Surina Shukri of MDEC was talking about the kind of percentages or percentage points that can be added into the GDP if we reinvigorate our digital economy. Uh, and when Surina uh, came on the show, on this show in particular, talking about the kind of upside uh, that is uh, possible if we have a very robust and vibrant uh, digital economy, it's going to be beneficial for everyone, particularly in a time when the pandemic has forced a lot of players, industries, um, and uh, you know, uh, sectors that no don't normally want to get into the tech, they are already in the tech sector because of the, um, uh, the pandemic. This is an opportunity that we shouldn't waste. And there is very little rebuttal to go against these kind of arguments because, of course, it will increase the GDP. Of course, it will provide a lot of upside. So we all want to see this happen. However, my biggest pet peeve of this kind of you know, long-term blueprints is that in 10 years' time, things can be so dramatically different. I mean, just think about 10 years ago in 2011 when 3G was entering its nascent stage. I don't think there was even 4G then. The world was looking so different back in 2011. How will the world look like in 2031? My problem with this digital blueprint having a 10-year program is that you might not be able to anticipate the kind of changes that lie ahead. What do you think of this whole My Digital Blueprint and My Digital Economy and all the other stuff that the government have been announcing? Is it going to be worthwhile going through it line by line, understanding the kind of policies within it? Or is it more of the government having a blue sky theory to a point where we don't know how it's going to be executed? What's your view on this? I think overall, um, my digital in the overall view, I think it's a very good ambition because yes, it's important that we move up to a high income nation using digital economy. There's a lot of uh, key points which I think is very good, such as digitalization, or, sorry. Mm. There's a lot of good points like digitalization, the uh, government, mm. uh, move everything to the cloud. Uh, increase our uh, infrastructure and increase more data centers investment. Those are good key points. But what's lacking is the execution part. And you rightly point out, 10 years out of this can happen. But we're lacking the details. How is it going to be executed? Like for example, uh, one of it which was announced was the rollout of 5G. Suddenly, everything is all hands on that. Let's roll out 5G. But there's still very little details. And the target is to launch 5G by end of this year, by end of 2021. But until now, uh, we only know that there is an SPV. That's uh, Digital National Berhad, but it's lacking on details. How is it going to be run? I'm sorry, I don't know this. Digital National Berhad? Yeah. What is this? That's the name of the SPV. So in t previously, when it rolls out 4G or 3G technology, what happens is that the spectrum is actually allocated to the specific telcos through yes. an auction. But this time, the government decided, you know what, because uh, the cost is very high for telcos to invest, we want to take that investment burden off you. So instead of giving spectrum to the individual telcos like Cellcom, DG, Maxis, they're giving it to a government entity that's called Digital National Berhad. Okay, so this Digital National Berhad um, being the special purpose vehicle for them to be carrying out. So for instance, My Jandela, are they executing the program as well for My Jandela? My Jandela is different. My Jandela is mostly on the existing the 4G, telcos. The 4G, uh, widening the 4G. Exactly. So Jandela is more on increasing fiberization. So, so, so the Digital National Berhad specifically for the 5G rollout. Exactly. The government has revised its plan on the 5G national pro, uh, program rollout to fourth quarter of this year. This is of course a revision from the initial target of fourth quarter last year. We've seen how uh, the previous administration was rolling out the um, test cases uh, of 5G in a lot of places, namely Nankawi mostly, but uh, a few other places, Cyber Jaya, if I'm mistaken. But because of the pandemic, everything has been pushed back. And the Mindjadila program was reintroduced, sorry, not reintroduced, the Mindjadila program was introduced to widen the 4G coverage of the country. 
including the pedalaman places, the um, uh, uh, the rural places, uh, particularly in Sabah and Sarawak, Vibinoa, if you all yep. remember the story. Um, wh what's what's happening with all these 5G and 4G rollout as well, including the Manjandila program? Are you getting a lot of news out of it? Yeah, in fact, uh, actually MCMC has released like a quarterly report. So this was re released one yesterday. So in terms of delivering the 4G targets and the number of premises that's covered by fiber, uh, we are actually on track. Actually, most of the telcos, they have been delivering above the specific targets. So the government is confident that we're going to achieve 96.9% 4G population coverage and 7.5 million fiberized premises throughout the country by end of 2022. Mm. So the original idea was we launched Jendela in favor of kicking out 5G earlier is to that we have a strong foundation. So the key thing is to increase our 4G footprint and have more places covered with fiber. So that was the plan. So at that time, the government said that we are not ready for 5G yet. Let's strengthen the existing infrastructure. And after the launch of My Digital, suddenly 5G is back to the table again. Okay, mm. we're going to launch 5G at the same time as Jendela. Mm. So that's going to be released sometime by end of this year. But of course, uh, DMB hasn't released any statements whatsoever yet because it's still in early stage. Okay, um, finally, how do you think this will pan out eventually? The whole story of how this digitization of the country and the blueprint, do you think it's going to work out at the end of the day? Right now, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered because there's a lot of big ambitions, but we have issues here and there like the Kabatash issue and there's a lot of, a lot of questions on the 5G rollout because with this implementation, we've never done this in before in Malaysia. So for the first time, the spectrum is going to be given to the digital national world hub and the existing telcos will be getting the service through a wholesale agreement. Mm. So that's the difference. So there's a lot of concerns as well, like for example, how can telcos differentiate themselves with other telcos? Because essentially, everyone will have the same 5G coverage. Mm. So I guess the, the outcome will be, there'll be a heated price competition because there's very little to differentiate and perhaps the telcos will move into doing more convergent services like bundling with um, fiber and maybe uh, video streaming uh, platforms to to offer some differentiation among each other. Fantastic. Okay. Um, definitely happy to have you on again uh, when these developments happen. But for now, uh, we'll go for one more short break. Uh, when we come back, uh, we will definitely talk about the Cellcom and DG, or oh, sorry, Exiata and DG potential merger. Uh, that's coming up after the break. But for now, that was our conversation with Alexander Wong, the managing editor of Searching Chao. We'll be back after these messages. Thanks for staying on. We'll touch a little bit about the big news today because uh, Exiata and Talanor are said to be in advanced discussion to merge their subsidiaries, uh, namely Cellcom and DG. And as we know, Cellcom uh, and DG are both the second and third uh, largest telco in Malaysia in, by way of subscribers. And because of this, this is going to be an interesting merger to be uh, seen and discussed. Uh, particularly when we talk about the shareholding structure of this merged co between uh, Cellcom and DG. As publicized by Dato' Izzadin earlier today, uh, both uh, Cellcom and DG, or in this sense, Exiata and Talanor, will have an equal shareholding of 33.1% each, and Exiata and Malaysian investors will own over 51%. If you all remember, uh, November 2019, uh, was the date when uh, this first proposed merger was announced to be cancelled off. They said, and quote, um, complexities was the issue. Uh, of course, the subtext to this is that whether or not uh, the Malaysian interest will be kept proposed uh, or under the merger then. And of course, there's a lot of noise when it comes to uh, jobs being lost uh, and whether or not Telenor will have a greater share uh, in terms of how the smooth running of the company. Uh, all that is going to be uh, uh, the reason why uh, the merger did not go through back then, uh, two years ago. But according to the announcement made by uh, Exiata today, uh, the proposed merger of Cellcom and DG will have uh, the nation's interest at heart and perhaps uh, could allay some of the concerns arising from the earlier proposed merger discussions back in 2019. It's also worth noting that they've also announced key leadership announcements following the merge call, with the chairman being Dato' Izzadin Idris and the vice chairman being Jorgen Arens Rostrup, uh, one from Exiata, one from Telenor. 
the CEO under the Merge Co. will be the current CEO of Cellcom, which is uh, Idham Nawawi. And the deputy CEO of this Merge Co. will be Alburn Muti. Alburn is, of course, the current DG CEO. Uh, and uh, when we see them melding together, uh, it seems like the leadership will be Exiata. Uh, and uh, the follower will be Talanor by virtue of the chairman being Datuk Izzadin and the CEO being Idham Nawawi. The merge is, of course, the uh, amalgamation of an industry that is very, very tight and very, very challenging. Uh, we know that this industry has been um, facing uh, a conversation of uh, merger and intense comp competition. So perhaps the amalgamation of these kind of companies is going to pave a way of more profitability for those two companies moving forward. So we'll cover this news uh, with great detail in the days and weeks to come. So stay tuned to Astro Awani as we try to ensure that the nation's interest as well as your interest in terms of reading this news is going to be uh, kept at its best interest. For now, thanks very much for watching. Until next time.